Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about the two amino acids that get degraded to this metabolite right here, and that's glutamate gamma semi glutamate gamma semi-aldehyde. Okay? In a separate video, we'll actually look at the catabolism from there, but at least I want to converge to this product. Okay? And the two amino acids that get degraded to glutamate gamma semi-aldehyde are arginine and proline. And in the first half of this video, I want to talk about the easier one, and that's going to be arginine. And to an extent, if you've watched the urea cycle video, you're already familiar with the first enzyme, and that's arginase. Right? Um, that was part of the urea cycle. And at that point, we had synthesized arginine, right? We already saw the biosynthesis of arginine in that video. And if you recall, we took arginosuccinate and we, we reacted it with arginosuccinate lyase, and that cleaved off fumarate, right, which went into the TCA cycle, and that left us with arginine, right? And then we took arginase, which was a hydrolytic enzyme, and we got out urea. Okay, and in the process, what we did is we generated ornithine. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of is ornithine really has two main paths. The path we saw in the urea cycles was where the ornithine got transported back into the mitochondria, right? And it reacted with activated, um, activated ammonia in the form of carbamoyl phosphate, right? And that was done by the enzyme ornithine transcarbamoylase, right? And that gave you citrulline, which got transported back out into the cytosol. So ornithine can go back into the mitochondria where it will react with ornithine transcarbamoylase, or it can react with a transaminase. And the specific name of the transaminase is shown, if I can find my mouse, it's shown, oops, it's shown right here, and that's ornithine delta aminotransferase. Now notice what's happening. It's the same reaction, right? You're starting with alpha ketoglutarate and you're going to glutamate. So what we should have is we should have an amine right here, and you should expect that we should replace that with a carbonyl bond. Now if you remember the video where I talked about um, transaminases. If you remember, I said we're essentially replacing an amine with a carbonyl, and then the other molecule, we're replacing the carbonyl with an amine, right? It pains me to say this, but you can effectively think of it as a substitution between a carbonyl and an amine, right? That's at least the way you can conceptualize it on an exam if they're not asking for the pyridoxal phosphate dependent mechanism. Now, um, if you remember from that video where we talked about transaminases, I said that 99% of the time when you do a transaminase reaction, the carbonyl that you generate is a ketone, right? This is that other 1% of the time. Notice that it's not the alpha amine that we're doing the transamination with. It's actually the delta amine on ornithine. Right? So it's this amine down here on the R group. Remember, ornithine's an amino acid, right? It's an amino acid. It's a strange one that you won't find in proteins, but it's an amino acid nonetheless, except we're doing the transamination with the delta amine. Okay? And so as a result of the car as a result of the carbon that's part of the amine, as a result of it, um, only having one other carbon group attached to it, what we're going to end up generating is an aldehyde. So this is the aldehyde we're talking about, and that's what's characteristic of glutamate gamma semi-aldehyde. Okay, so that's the degradation of arginine, and honestly, it's a lot, it's a lot easier of a topic than proline. Proline's really interesting, and proline's actually a really fun topic, and before we, I, we go into proline's details, um, what I want to mention is that I'm going to be talking a little bit about apoptosis, and I'm going to assume that you've had at least a little bit on apoptosis, and I'll try to fill in a little bit of the details if you have it. Um, apoptosis is programmed cell death. So there comes a time in which, uh, let's say you have DNA damage to a particular cell. Um, now, ordinarily, if there's just a little bit of DNA damage, and there, there comes to be uh, from time to time, if there's just a little bit, the cell has a pretty easy time repairing it. There are different kinds of DNA repair enzymes that repair the DNA, and then once you repair the DNA, you can go into the S phase of the cell cycle where you synthesize and replicate the DNA, and then you undergo mitosis, right? But the key is you have to have 
good DNA. In other words, you have to have mutation-free DNA in order to complete the S phase, right, before you can go into mitosis, okay? But there comes some times when there's so much DNA damage that the cell, rather than wasting energy on doing, on repairing that magnitude of DNA damage, it instead undergoes apoptosis. And the cell just kind of throws its hands up and says, okay, for the greater good of this organism, I'm just going to kill myself so that I don't replicate myself. In other words, I don't divide and basically clone myself, which is what my, mitosis is. So instead of spreading the uh, the damaged DNA to future generations of cells, it just kills itself. And that's what apoptosis essentially is. And there are various mechanisms that take place during apoptosis. For instance, um, we might have a video someday on it, and you'd find that there's a whole bunch of caspases, which are apoptotic-inducing enzymes that get activated. And one other thing that you need to be aware of is there's a particular protein that is in very high concentration whenever you're undergoing apoptosis. And that's this protein right here, this protein called P53. P53, when it gets overstimulated, it induces apoptosis. And not only does P53, uh, it, well, not only is it synthesized in high amounts when you're undergoing apoptosis, but you also get a lot of reactive oxidative species. And one of the enzymes that's able to synthesize reactive oxidative species is proline oxidase. And the reaction that's shown here for proline oxidase is not exactly correct, and we'll go into why that is in just a few minutes. Okay, But what I want, at least want to say, first of all, is there's a general cycle for proline oxidase. And actually, a better name for this enzyme is proline dehydrogenase. And actually, if you find the name proline dehydrogenase in the literature, they're essentially talking about proline oxidase. The reason some texts call it proline oxidase is that one of the terminal electron acceptors in the mechanism can be oxygen, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, now... What you must understand is we have proline, right? We have proline, and what we can essentially do is we can dehydrogenate it into something called delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate, okay? So that's the immediate product of dehydrogenation, and specifically the, the electrons that are abstracted when we form the shift base, they go to FAD, Right? So the immediate product, at least in the, from the enzyme's perspective, besides delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate, is FADH2. Okay? Is FADH2. Now, those electrons can go to multiple sources. Okay? One of the ways in which proline oxidase um, functions is it can deliver those electrons from FADH2 to ubiquinone. Okay, so that would be coenzyme Q in the oxidized state. And then coenzyme Q can pick up the two electrons from FADH2, and that would generate ubiquinol, the reduced form of coenzyme Q, right? But there's another way that this can work. And what ends up happening is if you have molecular oxygen, right? And this is what they're talking about in this reaction where you have one half oxygen molecule, right? You can have molecular oxygen, right? Let me do it like this. You have you have um, one half oxygen, right? So they're just talking about one atom of oxygen, and it can pick up the two electrons. So it's a two electron transfer. It can pick up the two electrons from FADH2, and that's going to give you water. And of course, in the process, you'd have to also pick up two protons, right? So the key is. In any case, whether you're going from FAD to FADH2, or coenzyme Q oxidized to coenzyme Q reduced, or half of the oxygen molecule to water, it's always going to be a two-electron, two-proton process. Okay, But specifically, what we're concerned with is the two electrons. Now, in all proline oxidases or proline dehydrogenases, the initial electron acceptor from proline in the generation of delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate is FAD. And so what you're going to get is FADH2. Okay, Now, what changes in this enzyme is the terminal electron acceptor. And that is going to be, in one case, coenzyme Q. And you can imagine that it's going to be reduced into ubiquinol. Right? And then the ubiquinol will go and then and fuel into the electron transport chain. And specifically, it's going to feed into uh, ubiquinol cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which is complex three of the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Right, But one of the, um, 
one of the other electron acceptors can be molecular oxygen. Now, let's talk wh about why they put one half oxygen. Okay, what they're trying to do in this reaction sequence, and quite frankly, they do it in most texts, where they put one proline goes to one delta one pyrrolene five carboxylate, and that reduces one half of molecular oxygen to water. The reason they do that is because they're trying to show one cycle of proline oxidase. But what it turns out is that in order to totally reduce one molecular oxygen, it actually takes two proline oxidase cycles. And keep in mind with this reaction that it, it doesn't matter what the final electron acceptor is. The FAD overall doesn't change in the reaction because as soon as the electrons are accepted from FADH2, right, the FADH2 is going to be reoxidized back to FAD. So there's no net change in FAD, but the, the, the terminal electron acceptor is what changes and that's what gets reduced. But a better way, a better way to view this reaction is like this. Instead of having a one half as a coefficient, we can instead say, let's say we have two prolines, right? Two prolines and that's plus, plus we'll do it like this. We have one molecular oxygen, right? And by the way, this is going to be a four electron transfer process. In other words, we're going to have two cycles of proline oxidase, two cycles. And so what we're going to get is two, two delta one pyrrolene five carboxylates. And then we're also going to get two molecules of water. So two H2O. That's a better way of putting this reaction. When they're saying that it, it reduces one half of an, a molecular oxygen to water, what they're talking about is this is one cycle of proline oxidase. But in order to totally reduce a full molecular oxygen molecule, you have to have two cycles of proline oxidase, and you would end up getting two waters. Okay? There's two atoms of oxygen in molecular oxygen, so you'd need two waters to account for that. So they're just trying to show you one proline oxidase cycle, okay? and of course that goes to water. Okay, so I just want to drive that point home. And another thing that's interesting about this enzyme is that it's activated especially during the apoptotic process. Okay, and to understand that, let's talk about P53. P53 is a protein that's upregulated during um, times of DNA damage. And if there's a significant quantity of DNA damage, P53 gets overstimulated and it starts activating other pr proteins and enzymes. One of the enzymes that it activates is proline oxidase. So if the cell has already been committed to apoptosis by P53, proline oxidase starts getting upregulated, which means that there's an increased biosynthesis of proline oxidase. So what it means is that the highest amount of proline catabolism is going to be observed during the apoptotic process. Okay. And so you should expect that whenever you're undergoing apoptosis, you're going to have a lot of delta-1 pyrrolene-5 carboxylate. And actually, one of the interesting things about this enzyme is that remember that the terminal electron acceptor can change. And so what can happen is, what can happen is, instead of totally reducing molecular oxygen down to water, right, instead of doing that, what can happen is you can take molecular oxygen you can take molecular oxygen, right? And keep in mind that the correct structure of molecular oxygen is like this, right? Essentially what would happen is molecular oxygen would undergo a homolytic bond cleavage, right? So the correct structure of oxygen is actually this, okay? And keep in mind that this form of molecular oxygen that's shown on the bottom, that's actually what the terminal electron acceptor would be in the form of. And let's say, Let's say, for instance, that proline oxidase catalyzes an electron transfer into this molecular oxygen. Well, what you generate, what you would generate is this. You would generate this. You would generate one of the oxygen atoms now has a negative charge. Okay, this is called superoxide. It's called superoxide, and it is termed a, re a reactive oxidative species. And the reason it's called reactive is because one of the oxygen atoms 
or yeah, this one has a radical electron on it, okay? And specifically, it's a very reactive radical electron. It will spontaneously oxidize proteins, and it will oxidize fatty acids and nucleic acids and all sorts of things that are bad for the cell. So part of the strategy in activating proline oxidase, or at least upregulating it during times of apoptosis, is that you're going to get an increased synthesis of reactive oxidative species. In fact, that's one of the proposed mechanisms as to why proline oxidase gets upregulated during apoptosis. In fact, when you're doing normal protein catabolism, proline is not one of the normal amino acids that's catabolized in high amounts. It's really catabolized, though, during apoptosis. Okay, so what I want to drive home, the main thing is that this the way they've drawn the reaction is really stupid. Okay, is really stupid. They really should have said two prolines go to two delta-1 pyrrolene 5 carboxylates and one molecular oxygen is reduced to two water. So in all, if you were going to totally reduce molecular oxygen, it's going to be a four electron process. And if you've seen the electron transport chain videos, right, you've seen something like that. You've seen cytochrome C oxidase. That was an oxidase and it took four electrons in order to totally reduce oxygen to water. It's the same type of thing. Okay, so let's go over the mechanism of that really quickly. So this molecule right here, this molecule is FAD. Remember that FAD is going to be the oxidized form of this particular flavin. And in the process of the two electron transfer of the proline oxidase cycle, FAD is going to be reduced into FADH2. So FADH2 is the reduced form, okay? And those electrons, those electrons from FADH2 are then going to be shunted into ubiquinone, and in the process it'll reoxidize FADH2 back to FAD. So in the process of this electron transfer, we should get we should get those electrons going into ubiquinone, which is one possible uh, terminal electron acceptor. Remember, we can also have oxygen as an electron acceptor, um, but this is just one possible one. And in the process of picking up those electrons, ubiquinone gets reduced into ubiquinol. Okay. And remember that part of the structure of ubiquinone that gives away that it's part of, that at least it's oxidized, is going to be this quinone ring, right? This quinone ring is the giveaway that it's in the oxidized form, whereas notice that the quinol, the quinol form is characteristic of the reduced form of coenzyme Q. Okay, and just remember that if oxygen is the electron acceptor, then it's going to take two cycles of proline oxidase to totally reduce oxygen to molecular, or excuse me, molecular oxygen to water. And I hope this makes sense, okay? Two proline oxidase cycles are required in order to totally reduce molecular oxygen into water, and you should get two water molecules. Remember, molecular oxygen has two atoms of oxygen, and you would, would take two molecules of water to account for both oxygen atoms, okay? Now, one other thing that's really, um, really interesting about proline oxidase is it's actually thought that part of the mechanism of things like seasonal affective disorder and schizophrenia, it's thought that part of the mechanism is deficiency of proline oxidase. And you can certainly go into the literature and find theories about that. So it's just interesting to think about, um, you know, could, could potentially problems with apoptosis uh, affect um, conditions like schizophrenia and depression and things like that. So just something to file away in the memory. And another thing that's interesting about this enzyme, we already mentioned that this particular enzyme is going to feed um, electrons into the electron transport chain, right? One of the electron acceptors, at least the terminal one, is ubiquinone, which gets reduced to ubiquinol. And if you remember, the ubiquinol is going to transfer its electrons into complex 3. Complex 3, which is ubiquinol cytochrome C oxidoreductase. So really, the ubiquinol is then going to transfer its electrons to cytochrome C. Hmm, well that's interesting, right? Because if you remember, cytochrome C is part of the mechanism of apoptosis, right? It's part of the mechanism. In fact, cytochrome C is responsible for activating caspase 9. Okay, remember that caspases are enzymes that activate apoptosis, right? And so potentially, 
proline oxidase, if it's able to feed its electrons into cytochrome C, it's going to change the oxidation state of cytochrome C, right, by channeling electrons into it through ubiquinol. So it's possible that proline oxidase in large part controls the activity of cytochrome C and therefore has its hands in controlling apoptosis. Again, none of these things are really proven, but it's just things to, you know, to think about, things that are kind of interesting. Okay, enough on that. At this point, we've generated delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate. Now, there's going to be a spontaneous process that occurs in the direction of running from delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate to glutamate gamma semialdehyde. And notice in this molecule that we've generated, right, right here in delta-1 pyrrolene 5-carboxylate, there's a shift base, right? Essentially, when we oxidize proline, we get a shift base. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be a shift base hydrolysis. And if you need help predicting those products of shift base hydrolyses, we have a video on that. And so we're going to get a shift base hydrolysis. And what you would know is if you knew shift base hydrolysis, you would know that the products of it, in this case, is going to be an amine and an aldehyde. And that's exactly what we see in glutamate gamma semialdehyde, right? We have an aldehyde that's right here, right? And then we have our free amine that's up here. Okay, so that's enough for this video. Um, we've seen that proline and arginine get degraded to glutamate gamma semialdehyde. In the next video, we're going to look at the fate of glutamate gamma semialdehyde. See you in the next video.